Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Vic. I'm the founder of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum and uh, very happy to have uh, online with us today uh, Javier Idiami from uh, Barcelona, who's going to talk about this uh, very, very interesting um, research work and uh, artistic project that uh, he and his team have actually been working on for quite some time. Uh, I came across uh, Javier's work sort of by accident. I was uh, searching on the internet a couple of weeks ago uh, about this notion of uh, image generation using neural networks, which is actually quite a well-known and quite a common kind of use of neural networks. Of course, I found lots and lots of examples on uh, generative adversarial networks. I found lots of examples on variational autoencoders and then sort of nestled in between those uh, search results was this notion of lost landscapes. And so I went inside it and I said, well, it's not this and it's not that, so what is it? Uh, it was really fascinating as I started to discover all the phenomenal work that Javier and his team have done, where in fact, the output is the model itself, where they take those high dimensional model parameters and they pass them through a visualization layer and really create these haunting vistas. And it's fascinating. Some of those images are of cosmological scale. It almost looks like you're looking at a nebula or you're looking at some kind of a star cluster or you're looking at some kind of the surface of a, a foreign planet, alien planet far, far away. But then some of the other images look like they're microcrystalline type structures that you would see when you have a um, atomic scale uh, microscope. So fascinating, fascinating work and, and a bit different from our traditional sessions because I know typically we look at a lot of hands-on coding technology, but I think it's it's really an eye-opening kind of talk. So without further ado, I do want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome a very special guest to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. Javier, I'm a big fan of your work and I know that uh, it's really growing in popularity. So uh, I don't want to take any more time. I think uh, our, our colleagues want to watch you and, and hear from you and see all the amazing stuff you're doing. So take it away, Javier. Over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Vic, uh, and thank you to uh, Synthetic Intelligence Group and to you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's really exciting to be with uh, you and the audience uh, today. So let's go for it. It's a pleasure to be with uh, all of you today for this Lost Landscape Project presentation. And we're going to do a very fascinating journey together. And this journey begins with us. It begins with human beings, with the Homo sapiens, that from the beginning of history have been moving and exploring around three-dimensional space. Our space that has three dimensions. And, and if we fast forward through the history of our world and we arrive to the deep learning revolution, then what we see is that in the deep learning revolution, the researchers have embarked on this fascinating challenge. The challenge to visualize spaces that have millions of dimensions, even billions or trillions of dimensions. These beings that live in three-dimensional and operate and explore in three-dimensional space. And I invite you today to do this journey with me. This presentation is going to be a journey and adventure together as we explore this challenge of visualizing these spaces that have millions and billions of dimensions. And I have structured this presentation in two parts. In the first part, I want to give you the context the why and the how of these visualizations because this is very important to then jump onto a series of these pieces of these visualizations that are going to touch on many different topics from learning rate, stress tests, to mode connectivity, morphology studies, ResNets, the library project, activation functions, the lottery ticket hypothesis, Edge horizons, downfalls, dropout, Bayesian deep learning, GANs, geometric deep learning, and I will end up blessing all of you with the blessings of dimensionality. So let's begin this journey together. So before we go to explore many of these visualizations, as I'm telling you, we are first going to begin with the context, the why, and the how. So let's begin. The background of this project, this project really connects with a lot of what I've been doing for many years. A lot of my background, touching on the engineering side, the research, the creative direction, the artistic side, the entrepreneurial side. And this challenge of visualizing these spaces made of millions and billions of dimensions in the last years has gone through an evolution uh, through one dimensional plots 2D plots, 3D plots, and the purpose of this project is to take these visualizations 
onto greater and greater detail and also to explore their dynamics, to explore them in movement and also to look for new ways of presenting them in, in new creative and artistic ways as well. And it all began for me with this paper. This paper of Tom Goldstein's team with Hao Li, Tseng Shu, Gavin Taylor, Christoph Stutter and Tom Goldstein, a paper presented in New Rips 2018 and written, I believe, in 2017, a revolutionary paper that took this kind of visualizations to a new greater level. I was very, very inspired by this paper and my engineer and researcher side wondered, can we take this into greater and greater detail? Can we take it into a larger exploration of the dynamics, uh, looking for more and more insights? And the creative uh, direction and artistic side wondered, can we also explore new ways of presenting and visualizing these uh, explorations? And the entrepreneurial side wondered, well, this is a crazy idea, so let's do it. All right, so I'm now going to give you quickly the context to understand how these visualizations are produced. So we have the neural networks, for example, convolutional networks that are classifying images with an input, with the inputs and the outputs. And in the layers of the network, we have all these millions and billions of weights and parameters. So these uh, functions, these, these functions that are mapping the inputs to the outputs depend on the data set and these parameters. And if we want to tweak, if we want to change these parameters with the back propagation and gradient descent so that we gradually uh, uh, improve the performance of the network in the direction that we're interested in, we first need to be able to measure, to measure the performance of the network. And we measure that performance with a function that we call the loss function. And that loss function depends on the parameters of the network. And we have millions or billions of parameters. So it's a very, these are very high dimensional functions. And we can use a lot of different functions to uh, measure the performance of the network. For example, if we're doing a regression, we may be working with mean square error that penalizes the predictions that deviate a lot from the right values. If we are classifying images, we may be using cross entropy that penalizes a lot of the predictions that are confident but wrong. If we are working with GANs, we may be dealing with, with this uh, minimax game between the generator and the discriminator as they try to minimize and maximize this function. If we are working with a Wasserstein GAN, then with the, we will see the generator and the critic try to maximize these uh, different functions. All in all, the loss function is trying not only to measure the performance of the network, but also to find the most efficient way to push those weights, those parameters in the direction that takes us in the most efficient way to the objective that we have. And these visualizations, why are they so useful and important? Because when we find the performance of the network, we would like to know not just the performance in the point in which we are in weight space. It would be also great to understand what happens if we move a little bit to a different position in weight space. How is the geometry and the shape of that loss function? What is the structure of that loss function? Is it smooth? Is it chaotic? Is it a rugged landscape? How is the distribution of the convexities and non-convexities of that uh, geometry? Because if we understand the structure of this loss function, we may be able to improve our optimization algorithms and our networks. And in this very important mission, numerical analysis and visualizations complement each other. They both attack this challenge from different perspectives. One of them more sequential, the other one more simultaneous. They both work at different levels of abstraction, always trying to understand in better ways the structure of the loss function. And understanding the geometry of this loss function is crucial because there are very important implications that relate that geometry to the performance of the networks. For example, if we use uh, stochastic gradient descent, SGD, in combination with small batch sizes, it's been shown that the minimas that we reach 
tend to be wider and flatter, and this tends to correlate with better generalization. And the opposite may happen if we use the Adam optimizer and large patch sizes. For a while, there was a lot of controversy about this, you know, opinions back and forth, but there's been now experimental de demonstration about this. So we see here an example of how the geometry of a specific part of the lost landscape has direct implications on the performance of the network and its generalization capabilities. Now, all in all, we are dealing with very, very high dimensional spaces. Spaces that we cannot visualize, that we cannot understand. Spaces that are very cryptic for us, that are a puzzle for us. And this takes us to Flatland. Very funny sometimes for us when we think of people living in two-dimensional spaces that they, uh, they face very counterintuitive things. When things are changing in the three-dimensional world, and they look very normal and continuous in the 3D world, but when they are observed from flatland, from the two-dimensional world, a lot of non-intuitive things happen. You see things appear and disappear. Well, the interesting thing is that as we deal ourselves from our three-dimensional world, with visualizing these super high dimensional spaces with millions and billions of dimensions, we are also going to feel a bit as if we live in flatland. Because we are also going to perceive a, a few and a lot of counterintuitive and non-intuitive things that we are going to visualize. And we are going to talk about a few of them during this presentation. All right. So, when we train our networks, when we use stochastic gradient descent, and we reach a solution, we reach a minima, we reach a point in weight space. A point, a combination of our parameters, a point in weight space. And then what we want is we don't want to be blind, as we were saying. We want to be able to look around our position. Because we want to know not only the performance of the network, the loss value at that point in weight space. We want to know again, what happens if we move a little bit? Is it a smooth surface? Is it a rugged surface? Is it a chaotic surface? Because this will have very important implications, for example, for how the gradients correlated with the different mini batches. How is the distribution again of the convexities and non convexities? May we uh, get stuck or trapped in some parts of the landscape? So we want to move around, and we can move around in many different ways. For example, we can get to a point in weight space. And then we can pick a random direction in high dimensional space. And we can interpolate from that point in weight space alongside that random direction. We can sample a few points, we can calculate the loss values, and we can do a plot. Or we can get to a couple of points in weight space. For example, one calculated with small batch size, another one with large batch size. Then we can do a linear interpolation between them. We can pick a few, sample a few points in that linear interpolation, calculate the loss values, and do a one-dimensional plot. Or, as introduced by the wonderful paper of Tom Goldstein's uh, team, we can reach a point in weight space, then we can pick a couple of random directions, random orthogonal directions, that make a plane, and we can slice the high-dimensional space with that plane. We can position our point in weight space in the center of that plane, and then we can project that point alongside that plane. We can then sample, like in a grid, different points in the plane, calculate the loss values, and build a surface and a 3D plot. And this is used very much in the Lost Landscape project. Another thing related to a wonderful paper by my friends of uh, NYU and MIT is the uh, mode connectivity, and we'll talk about this in one of the visualizations. That is finding connections, finding paths, finding routes that link different modes, different minima, while maintaining a very low loss value. That's mode connectivity, and we will explore it. And we can do many other things. We can do assembling. We can go to. We can reach different points in weight space and then average their predictions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is what, what we want to do. We want to move around, and we can use different mathematical equations to do all of these interpolations and explore this weight space. Now, something that people ask sometimes is, 
All right, if you use a couple of random directions to create a plane to slice the high dimensional space, how do you know that two random directions in very high dimensional space are orthogonal to each other? And this connects with that flatland analogy again. Because in very high dimensional space, a lot of things are counterintuitive. And this is one of them. But we can understand it with a very simple analogy. In a one-dimensional world, nothing orthogonal can exist. In a 2D world, orthogonal vectors, eh, perpendicular vectors, are going to form one-dimensional lines. In our three-dimensional world, if you pick a couple of orthogonal vectors, they are going to make a plane, a two-dimensional plane. So, in an n-dimensional space, the subspace occupied by orthogonal vectors has a n minus 1 dimensionality. This means the greater the dimensionality of a space, the greater is the proportion of that space that is occupied by orthogonal vectors. And we can use the cosine similarity to calculate the angle between vectors, and in n dimensions that's the square root of 2 divided by pn, and what this takes us finally is to see that in very high dimensionality, it is almost guaranteed that when you pick random directions, they are going to be orthogonal to each other. Another thing that people ask is, all right, you use random directions. What about using PCA directions, principal component analysis directions? And the answer is, you can use both. You can use all types of directions, but they serve for different purposes. For example, if you use PCA directions, you will be visualizing the part of the lost landscape that is the most optimized part. You will be visualizing the part that goes down the gradient that is very well behaved. And typically you will not see all the richness of the landscape. You will not see the non-convexities. You will be focused on that very optimized part of the gradient down which you are going through. If you want to visualize all the richness of the landscape, then you use the random direction, the random directions that will allow you to visualize the non-convexities and the convexities of the landscape. Then you have a challenge. Because when you use random directions, however, you have an issue with the trajectory of SGD. Why? Because it's been shown that the trajectory of SGD exists in a very low dimensional subspace. And if you pick a random direction, based on what I said before, most likely it is going to be orthogonal to the very low dimensional subspace that includes the trajectory of SGD. So in summary, if you use PCA directions, you can capture the variation in the trajectory of SGD. You are visualizing the most optimized part of the landscape, but you cannot visualize all the richness, all the non-convexities and convexities of the landscape. If you do the opposite, if you do the random directions, which is what is mainly used in this project, then you visualize and you capture all the richness of the landscape, all the distribution of non-convexities and convexities, but you cannot, you cannot capture all the richness and variation of the trajectory. So this is the difference between both. Now, the next very important thing to say is that once you use the random directions, to do this projection and slice the high dimensional space, the next very, very important thing is to normalize and scale these random directions. And why is this so, so very important? All right, just imagine a minimizer that has weights that are much larger than one. And another minimizer, another network that has weights much smaller than one. And now you use a perturbation to project them with a unit of one. Now, that perturbation is going to affect, is going to impact much more the network that has very small weights. And when you create the visualizations, one visualization is going to look smoother and the other one is going to look rougher. But what you are seeing is not the intrinsic geometry. What you are seeing is the difference in scaling between the perturbation and the network. And this can cause a lot of problems. And this is all related also to the scale invariance property of the networks. Because in a typical convolutional network, when you use batch norm, for example, you could have two different networks 
with different magnitudes in the weights, but they could be completely equivalent in performance. They could be equivalent to each other because batch normalization is going to rescale everything. So it doesn't matter if a filter has a larger or a smaller magnitude because batch normalization is going to rescale it, everything. So these two networks may actually be equivalent to each other, and yet in the visualization they will look different because the uh, perturbation is not normalized. This can cause a lot of problems. In this slide, we see some uh, graphs from Tom Goldstein's uh, team uh, paper, uh, in which we see an example of the problems that this can create. For example, if you train a couple of networks, one with small batch size, one with large batch size, and then you interpolate between uh, these uh, points in weight space, and then you create a visualization, and you see that in the small batch size, you get like a flat wide minima, and in the large batch size, you get like a sharp minima, and then you increase the weight decay. When you increase the weight decay, you penalize and you, you're going to lower the size of the weights. But because the updates are going to happen more often in the case of the small batch sizes, the weights are going to go smaller in magnitude, more in the case of the small batch. And then when you do the visualization again, you will see that the minima of the small batch size case is going to get sharper than the other one. But again, you are not looking at the intrinsic geometry. You are looking at the problem of the uh, contrast in, in scaling, in magnitude, of the perturbation and the weights of the network. So in order to solve this, what has to be done is to normalize the random directions. And this can be done very easily. You can normalize by layer, you can normalize by filter. By filter works really well. And you just take the random direction. The random direction is like, it's just like a vector of the same size of the parameters of our network. And you take a filter in the random direction and you uh, scale it so that it has, uh, you normalize it so that it has the same magnitude of the equivalent filter in the original network. And you do this with uh, all the filters, etc., etc. And this doesn't only apply to convolutional networks. It also applies to fully connected networks uh, in a way that a convolutional layer would be equivalent, sorry, a fully connected layer would be equivalent to a convolutional layer with a one times one output feature map, and a filter would correspond to the weights that make a neuron. And that's it. Once you have normalized the random directions, now, yes, this is very important because now you will be watching the intrinsic geometry of these landscapes, and most importantly, most importantly, you will be able to compare different visualizations. So, we move around weight space, we slice the high dimensional space, we do these dimensionality reductions, and this is the summary of it all. We go from these millions or billions of dimensions to do these dimensionality reductions. And a question that a lot of people ask then is, how useful are these visualizations and are they completely accurate? And we can answer this in two important ways. The first way is that dimensionality reduction is happening all the time, right, in our lives. When we take a photograph of the 3D world onto a 2D sensor, when we are working with a very complex project with hundreds of parameters that we simplify to the most essential ones, etc., etc. And the question is, are these dimensionality reduction versions a completely accurate representation of the original high-dimensional spaces? No, of course not. But are these dimensionality reductions providing useful information that can take us to new insights? Yes, definitely yes. And we can actually demonstrate it. Oh, here are our friends of Flatlands, always around. We can actually demonstrate it by using numerical analysis because it has been demonstrated that the main curvatures of these dimensionality reduced representations are actually an average, a weighted average of the main curvatures of the full dimensional space. And we can actually use the second order derivative, we can actually use the Hessian matrix, we can actually use the eigenvalues, we can use the ratio of the extreme eigenvalues, of the minimum and maximum eigenvalues, to build heat maps to study the distribution of the convexities and non-convexities of the high dimensional space and then compare those heat maps to our visualizations. And by doing this, we can demonstrate that yes, there is a correlation between the distribution of the non-convexities and convexities of these numerical analysis studies with our visualizations. 
And in summary, when we see non-convexities in these reduced dimensionality representations, it means that in the high dimensional space, there are no convexities. And when we see positive curvature, when we see convexities, it means that in the very high dimensional space, the positive curvatures, the convexities are dominant. All right? So, and that's all in summary. In summary, we apply all of these strategies to different architectures and changing and modifying different parameters. And now we arrive to the visualization part. And before we enter into the visualizations, I want to give, a, a, you know, I want to salute the great people of FastAI that were very important at the beginning of this project because working with lost landscapes is very complicated. It takes a lot of time takes a lot of computation. And at the beginning of the project, I had to do a lot of very agile experiments. And fast AI, the wonderful fast AI, was a wonderful help. Uh, and it's a wonderful help at all times. And is very much recommended by me always. All right, so let's start with the visualizations. And uh, let's go through each of them in turn. And what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is to you know, give some comments on each of them. I want to go to quite a lot of them. And at the end, we will have time for questions. All right, so let's begin with the first one. The first one is learning rate stress tests. These are a series of studies. Put the sound a bit down. These are a series of studies in which accuracy at the moment. what I'm doing is study the dynamics the of the lost landscape. The way the lost landscape changes as the learning rate is modified in different schedules. And what I'm studying is the resiliency range of the networks in relation to the changes in learning rate. Because there are these resiliency ranges in which you can modify and allow the network to explore at different speeds without moving onto Against parts of the test. high dimensional Raising space learning rate. that uh, make the training it. process intractable. And uh, when you go beyond these resiliency ranges, you can reach down. parts of the high dimensional space in which uh, the process breaks completely and the low dimensional representation collapses completely. This is one of the examples of a lot of studies that I have done with uh, following the dynamics of the lost landscape as the learning rate is modified. This is another example. So, uh, this is another example of following a schedule of the learning rate and uh, studying the dynamics of the edge horizon of the landscape, the minima of the landscape, searching for the minima as the learning rate schedule is followed. All right. Okay, now we go to mode connectivity, a wonderful paper by my friends at NYU and MIT, Timur Garipov, Pavel Ismailov, Dimitri Podoprihin, Dimitri Vetrov, Andrew Gordon Wilson. This is a wonderful paper and very, very, very fascinating uh, related to, you know, it used to be thought that the minima uh, of neural networks were isolated from each other, that they were like isolated basins. And if you wanted to go from one to the other, you always had to go through an area of very, very high loss. But thanks to the work of these uh, researchers and others, um, we have, um, they have found out that actually it's very, very easy to find connections that are not straight lines, they could be Vessier curves, polygonal paths, that connect different minima maintaining a low loss value. And how do they do it? Well, what they do is they use a gradient descent to find different minima, different points in weight space. And you know, two points make a line, three points make a plane. So they make a plane with three points in weight space. And then they take two of these points and they rotate this plane through all the dimensionality. And of course, you can do this in many different ways. So they pick a specific algorithm with a specific type of uh, uh, you know, path that they are, they are searching for, for example, a Bezier curve. And then they apply the algorithm until they find this, uh, this trajectory. In position. Uh, let me put the sound off. Beginning train. All right, let's see if we can start to see the video. Yeah. 
So what is fascinating in this visualization is that what we see, going back to the flatland analogy, we see the boundary between the two minima kind of melt and go down until the two minima are connected. And when we see this, we have to remember the flatland analogy. In the very high dimensional space where you can move in many different directions, as Jean Lecun said recently, you are going to have all these ways of connecting the minima, but when we translate this to our flatland reality, to our low dimensional representation, what we see is this counterintuitive thing in which uh, we see the, the boundary between the minima like going down until the two minima are connected. Again, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, very related to the, um, the feeling that somebody in the flatland 2D world would have when watching uh, what happens in the 3D world. We have here a very high resolution representation of the same uh, situation in which we can see the contrast between the smoothness that connects the smooth morphology that connects the two minima and the rougher morphology in other parts of the landscape that have very high loss value. This is another artistic, artistic representation, all of this always using real data, always using real data. This is another representation uh, showing the, the very rough morphology in areas that have higher loss value. And of course, this kind of rough morphology, uh, when the, the minimizer moves through this type of morphology, you can have problems of correlation of the gradients uh, of the mini batches, and this can complicate right, the training process. Okay, other views of these uh, extreme contrasts. A very beautiful view that we can also see in movement, although I see that the videos, but yeah, okay, we can see it. All right, very good. Now, studies. We go to studies. What are studies? Studies are situations in which I will take a network and I will modify different parameters and I will add dropout, I will experiment with different batch sizes, I will mix very high learning rate with very small batch sizes, and I will study and analyze the behavior of specific parts of the landscape while doing this. And this is very fascinating to see the different types of morphology that arise uh, with different combinations uh, from different perspectives. Uh, it's a really fascinating process, but it's a very complicated process and by the way, this is uh, an example with ResNets, where we can see that, yes, when you use skip connections with ResNets, hey, you get a smoother landscape. And also, when you study the dynamics, you can see the different behavior uh, in movement of the landscape as uh, you compare the non-skip connections and the better behavior of the network that has the skip connections. All right. Now, I was telling you that the, these comparisons are complicated, and a great example is in a recent paper the, called Pi Hessian Neural Networks Through the Lens of the Hessian by Zui Yao, Amir Golami, Kurt Kocher, and Michael Mahoney. And look what they say at the bottom of this paragraph. They say, in particular, we find that batch normalization does not necessarily make the lost landscape smoother, especially for shallower networks. Why is this interesting? Because a lot of people think that batch normalization may make the lost landscape smoother. But actually, what these researchers are finding out is the same thing that I have found in a lot of these studies. That the impact on the lost landscape of many of these uh, parameters is dependent on the kind of network that you are using. So the, the depth of the network and different properties of the network is actually many times going to impact the, uh, the effect that happens on the landscape by different parameters and different properties of these networks, which makes it all quite challenging. All right, this next is what I call, this is an ongoing project called the Lost Landscape Library. And this is uh, all using real data, but the, the interface that you're going to see in a minute uh, is still a prototype. And this is all about building like a library of lost landscapes where you will be able to see the impact of different parameters.
right, another example of studies is the work that I'm doing with a wonderful deep learning research group, Landscape, Landscape with K. Uh, this group is full of very talented researchers like Diganta Misra, Federico Lois, Ajayu Pili, Trikai Nalamada, Chris Akira, Junwei Liang, Himan Arora. And uh, we're doing side studies, studies like, for example, this recent one about MISH. MISH is a new kind of activation function uh, created by Diganta Misra. It's a non-monotonic smooth activation function that preserves some amount of the negative weights. Uh, so it improves the information propagation in the network. It is also more smooth. So, you know, we're working with the, with the, with the team, uh, specifically in this uh, project with Ajay Opili, with uh, Diganta, Diganta Misra, Trikai Nalamada. Uh, comparing uh, the lost landscape uh, when using different activation functions. And in this case, for example, comparing Aurelio and MISH, uh, comparing the conditioning that the, the landscape of the MISH activation function uh, is better conditioned, uh, is more smooth, the landscape of ReLU um, has a rougher morphology, uh, is less smooth as well. And we can extend this to other activation functions uh, like Swiss, for example, Swiss and MISH have a lot of similarities. Uh, but uh, we still find that in the landscapes, um, the MISH landscape is uh, still slightly better conditioned. Uh, it has slightly more smoothness. Uh, the Swiss also has issues of gradient collapse with very deep networks. And, you know, we do these studies in which we analyze and compare uh, different, different landscapes in relation to different parameters. All right, now we arrive to the Lottery Garden. Welcome to the Lottery Garden, everybody. Yes. What is the Lottery Garden? Well, the Lottery Garden is related to a wonderful paper called The Lottery Ticket Hypothesis by Jonathan Frankel and Michael Carvin. And as you probably know, this is about training with SGD, reaching a good solution, a good minima, and then pruning the weights of the network with different strategies. The strategies that I have used in my visualizations are the strategies of taking the weights that are the smallest ones and begin to prune them. This is a very typical strategy because the concept is that the, the weights that are the, they have the largest magnitude are the ones that probably contribute the most to, to the performance of the network. So we gradually prune and get rid of more and more weights of the network. And the amazing thing, and we're going to see it in the visualizations, all of these are lost landscapes created with the real data of this pruning process. And this um, this planes that you see below the landscapes, they are in the position of the best loss value reached by the original network on the test data set. So if you look from right to left, this is 0.04% of the weights pruned, then 20%, 35%, 48%, 59% of the weights pruned. And the parts of the landscapes that are breaking through the plane are landscapes that not only are equal in the performance of the original network, they are actually exceeding it. They are even, even pruning 50 or 60% of the weights, they are reaching a better performance. They are generalizing better than the original network, which is incredible. And by the way, the six uh, landscapes on each uh, column, uh, they represent six epochs. Okay, so basically I'm running six epochs, six epochs, six epochs at different pruning levels. Now, up to 80%, the lost landscape is very well behaved, is very smooth, and is very similar to the lost landscape of the original network. Between 80 and 90% of the pruning, the lost landscapes begin to uh, get more rough, begins to degrade, and after you reach in the high 90, 90%, 95%, 98%, uh, it eventually goes to a, a situation in which uh, in high dimensional space, the network is completely unable with such few weights uh, to find a path of convergence. Here we have a detailed representation. You can see how up to 75%, the lost landscape is very similar to the original one and it, in many occasions, it exceeds the performance of the original one. Up to 80%, it reaches or exceeds the performance between 80 and 90 percent, it begins to lose contact with the original performance. It begins to be unable to uh, go deep down to a, a good minima. And uh, finally, after you pass 95 percent, eventually you reach that point of collapse in which the whole training process completely breaks down. In this visualization, to the left is more pruning. You can see that the lost landscape is very well behaved until eventually it begins to flatten down. And in this horizontal representation, these fuchsia circles represent those 
winning lottery tickets, where you exceed the performance or equal the performance of the original network, and how horizontally eh, begins to flatten out, begins to be unable to tunnel towards a good solution until it completely collapses. is the edge horizon. What does it mean, the edge horizon? Well, when I've been working with lost landscapes now for a very long time, I have been giving names to different parts of these landscapes that are very interesting for me to explore. And I call the edge horizon to the area of transition to the main convexity of the landscape. And I call the downfall to the area that goes from the edge horizon to the minima. And then we have the minima. And you know, the geometry the size, the flatness, the width, the roughness, the smoothness, etc., of the edge horizon, of the downfall and of the minima, have very important implications and very important potential source of insights in relation to our networks. So in this visualization, you can see a very high resolution visualization of the approach to an edge horizon in very extreme resolution where we can see a lot of details of the morphology of the approach to this edge horizon. You see that the video is struggling a little bit, but yes, that's it. These are static views of the same. This is another visualization of Gentry. So in this visualization, we are following again the training process of a network as it begins to find a path to the minima. Going back to the flatland analogy, it's very interesting in the visualizations how many times we see that there is um, almost like a flat surface and it begins to tunnel down towards the minima. So you have to remember again the analogy with flatland. What uh, in the very high dimensional spaces is going to be a continuous connection in many different directions that link the different minima. When we do the dimensionality reduction to our flatland reality, for us, it's going to look like things appear and disappear, like this, this tunneling happens, like this, these gaps, these holes appear towards the minima, like the boundaries melt between the minima. This is our flatland reality. This visualization explores, by the way, um, the bottom part of the minima. All right? And this one is called Peace. Okay, and it's a visualization that explores an approach in high resolution to a minima the downfall and the bottom part. This is a very high resolution representation of a downfall between an edge horizon and a minima with a very detailed morphology. Uh, this is again what I was telling you before. This is the very counterintuitive uh, low dimensionality representation of the process of tunneling and opening the path towards the minima. Very, very fascinating. Goblin. Yes, Goblin is starting from the top of an edge horizon and then going down the downfall and exploring the minima. This is really fascinating. I mean, for me, it's just like, it's like a passion, you know? I mean, to think, and now we're going to go to drop out. That is fascinating. But if you think about it, you know, in our lifetimes, we will not be able to visit other galaxies, maybe. And we will not be able to understand or watch or visualize a, a million dimensional spaces, but we have tools. We have tools to explore them. This is extraordinary. We have tools to explore the galaxies that we cannot visit. And we have tools to explore million dimensional spaces that are totally beyond our reach. So dropout, as we add the dropout to our networks, this very distinctive 
noise layer begins to take over the lost landscape. And the intuition is very beautiful and very clear, right? As we know about dropout. That dropout gives us this homogeneous dynamic noise layer that is disruptive enough to prevent the network from memorizing the movements around weight space, from overfitting too much, but is not disruptive enough to prevent the network from converging to a good minima. Unless we increase the dropout so much that we completely overtake the entire landscape with this noise layer. And in this visualization, there are a couple of visualizations in this presentation. That is the first time that I show, this is one of them. Uh, the library was another one, the ticket as well. So we can see how we gradually add dropout and this noise layer gradually takes over the landscape. As we gradually increase the dropout, and you can see that when you are in a point in weight space and you move a little bit to the side, this, this noise layer is gonna keep you on your toes. It's gonna help you with generalization. All right, now we go to Bayesian deep learning. Bayesian deep learning, a paper, wonderful paper by, again, the friends of NYU, MIT, Wesley Maddox, Timur Garipov, Pavel Zmailov, Dmitry Vetrov, Andrew Gordon Wilson. And Bayesian deep learning is all about dealing with uncertainty. If we don't deal with uncertainty in deep learning, we may do overconfident predictions. So what these uh, wonderful researchers try to do is to create a probability distribution of the weights of the network that they call the posterior. But creating such distribution is very complicated, it's intractable. So instead, they approximate it. And to approximate it, they use the trajectory of a stochastic gradient descent. So they train a network, they, got, they get to a good solution, to a good minima, and then they use a high learning rate to move around and capture other solutions that explain well the training data, but do different predictions on the test data. And then with all of those solutions, they build a Gaussian probability distribution and they demonstrate that this Gaussian probability distribution explains very well the geometry of the posterior, which is the lost landscape. And in this series of visualizations, we see the real position of the real solutions on the lost landscape generated during their experiments and the positions on the Gaussian distribution that they create. We have static views of these explorations. Okay, now we go on to GANs, the wild networks. Well, you know what is the problem with GANs, right? That the original GANs had, uh, have a loss function that doesn't correlate well with the performance of the network. It doesn't correlate well with the quality of the images. So we get to this other type of GANs, the Wasserstein gradient penalty GANs. This use a completely different type of loss function that is based on the Earth's mover distance or Wasserstein's distance, that is the shortest average distance needed to move a probability mass from a distribution to another. And this loss function, yes, it correlates much better with the performance of the network and with the quality of the results of the images. And in this experiment, in these visualizations, I'm using the Saliba data set. And by the way, the, the way they do this in the Wasserstein gang, they put some constraints, the one Lipschitz constraint on the network, and you can do, you know, get to these constraints, you can clip the weights, but this causes side effects. So finally, what they do is a soft constraints in the gradient of the critic. Basically, they, they, they add a new term to the loss function uh, so that the L2 norm of the gradient of the critics is uh, close to one. And then just we can explore the loss landscape of the generator of the GAN. And it's very, very interesting because what we find when we analyze the loss landscape of the generator of the GAN in a specific case with the Saliba data set is that we really perceive the more uh, the wilder nature of these networks. They are much more dynamic. They have this very dynamic, uh, this, this variation and this um, harder, harder to tame behavior, you know? And there really is a field in which I am very, very interested in all the research that has been done to try to prevent all the, you know, all the collapses uh, and all the issues that, that this type of networks uh, have been dealing with. 
All right, geometric deep learning. This is just to tell you that this project began completely focused on the lost landscapes and is spreading to other areas as well. This is a collaboration with a company from Switzerland called Neural Concept SA, uh, with their wonderful team with Pierre Baquet, Lucas Zampieri, and Artem Shevchenko, in which is very interesting. We are uh, working with a geometric convolutional network and what we are visualizing is how this geometric convolutional network is predicting the aerodynamic properties of an aircraft, of a drone. And the numbers that you see are the predictions of the network, that is, the pressure exerted by the air on different parts of the drone. And the colors are the features that are being learned by the filters of the geometric convolutional network. So, in the same way that with traditional convolutional networks we can explore the features being learned by the filters in two-dimensional planes, here we are seeing them mapped onto a 3D surface because these are geometric convolutional networks. Really, really fascinating. And finally, approaching to the end, my friends, I want to end talking about the blessing of dimensionality. Because a lot of my work and my explorations on this project have taken me to really feel this blessing of dimensionality concept. For a long time, people have spoken about the cursing of dimensionality. That very high dimensional spaces introduce a lot of issues and challenges. But we are finding more and more that the very high dimensional spaces also have a lot of blessings and advantages. And there is a wonderful talk by Babak Hasibi called Deep Learning and the Blessing of Dimensionality that I highly recommend, in which Babak gives a wonderful analogy. Speaking of networks that are well initialized and well designed, he says that finding a good minima becomes a local problem. Instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, it is as if we were looking, as if we were exploring a haystack full of needles. And finding a minima becomes a local problem. You always have one of them nearby. This has been very emphasized as well by another wonderful paper called Deep Ensembles, A Lost Landscape Perspective by Stanislav Fort, Hui Hu, and Balaji Lakshminarajanan. In which uh, is a really fascinating paper, in which they say when you do random initializations of a network, they demonstrate that you reach and they also do a very interesting comparison with Bayesian deep learning. By the way, you do different random initializations, you reach different minima that are truly different. They, have, they can have equivalent performance, but they are truly different parts of the high dimensional space. They are truly different solutions, different minima, completely qualitatively different to each other. Again, it's as if when we have a good initialization, we can almost pick and choose. We always have a challenge. The challenge of finding the local minima becomes a local problem. And that's it. Just to complete, the reminder to always have in mind this flatland analogy and to appreciate the wonderful challenge that it is for us to face these super high dimensional spaces with millions, billions, and now very soon trillions of dimensions and the luxury that it is to have tools to explore and learn from these spaces and to deal and interpret the counterintuitive and non-intuitive things that we perceive through them, these wonderful, wonderful mysteries. Thank you very much.